there, I'm Dr. Vivian Lowe. You're on VLMD Rounds, a podcast on medical science and tools to optimize your health. I had always wanted to do an episode on neuroinflammation and behavior, um, and I thought maybe I'd give it a shot this time around on this episode. So I am going to be talking about how stress impacts um, certain cells in your brain, how you know, your brain changes as a response to especially chronic stress. And then I want to focus on anxiety and um, you know social avoidant type behaviors because generally when you hear people talk about neuroinflammation in the context of psychiatric illness, there's just such a range of illnesses that we're talking about, right? So we could be talking about major depression and other mood disorders, you know, bipolar um, disorders, that kind of thing. And then you also have schizophrenia at the other end of the spectrum. And then, you know, somewhere in there you have anxiety, for example. So, you know, it's just a lot. And rather than try and tackle all of those things, I thought in this episode, just to focus on stress and anxiety. Let's go. All right, you know, I have lots of patients who have um, chronic stress and also a lot of anxiety and to the point where the anxiety has been impacting their lives, making it difficult for them to function. So, you know, when I first see them, some of them are just so paralyzed by their anxieties and, you know, maybe panic disorders as well. And they've often asked me, you know, uh, you know, what's going on, Dr. Lowe? It's probably it's all going on in my head. True, it's going on in your head, but not in the way that you think. Um, And they want to understand a little better uh, what's going on in their brains. And of course, I... try to explain um, inflammation to them, but I usually don't have a lot of time to specifically dial in on inflammation in the brain. One thing I start with is to make sure that they understand that stress is really a highly physiologic process. One of the most measurable um, physiologic processes in our body, right? So when you're stressed, we can measure the components of stress as reflected in, for example, your blood pressure that tends to go up. Your heart rate also tends to go up. People, maybe they sweat a bit more and their breathing becomes more irregular and shallow, right? So there are all these signs that we can detect when someone is under stress because your physiology changes. And we also activate different areas in our brain, right? And this has an impact on our behavior. So we have the sympathetic nervous system, and this will secrete uh, adrenaline and noradrenaline. And also we have different hormones, glucocorticoid hormones that get into our bloodstream that become part of the stress response. Okay, we want to define the difference between acute stress, obviously, and chronic stress. So acute stress is more of the one-time stress events. So maybe you had a really uh, difficult exam coming up or you have um, a pressing deadline for a project at work, something like that. So a one-time one-time mish event doesn't happen all the time. Whereas chronic stress is repeated stress exposure. So ongoing financial stress, uh, maybe a really, um, you know, difficult environment at home, or you're working with people who are maybe not very friendly and, you know, kind of almost hostile at work. So that all these things can generate repeated stress because you got to go to work every day. For example, you live at home, right? And if that home environment is not conducive to rest and restoration, 
then we can, you know, have a lot more of this chronic stress going on. And then we're going to see changes in the neurotransmitter and hormonal levels in our body. Now, that would activate the stress response, but they also activate the immune system. So for example, when we see people with chronic stress, we find that they have high levels of inflammatory cytokines uh, like interleukin-6 in their bloodstream and increased numbers of immune cells like monocytes and neutrophils. So inflammatory cytokines, you'll hear me refer to them quite a bit in this episode, and they are basically substances that immune cells make and use to signal and talk to each other and to other cells in the body, okay? So cytokines can signal, obviously, to other immune cells, but they also signal other cells in the body that are not traditionally part of the immune system. So anytime you hear the word cytokine, we are talking about these signaling molecules. Often they are produced by these immune cells. So with repeated stress exposure, as I said, we have high levels of interleukin-6, that's an inflammatory cytokine. We can see high levels of interleukin-1, also an inflammatory cytokine, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and so forth. All right, now with today's episode, I specifically want to focus on a population of immune cells in your brain. And these are called microglia. M-I-C-R-O-G-L-I-A, microglia. And these are really the only immune cells in the brain parenchyma. When you hear me say brain parenchyma, I mean the brain tissue itself, within the brain tissue. Because you know, we have other types of immune cells that can be associated with areas around the brain or near the brain in, you know, in, in contact with the brain. But within the brain tissue itself, really under normal circumstances, the only immune cells there would be these microglia. All right? And these microglia are what we call tissue resident macrophages. Now, I've done a whole talk in the past on macrophages. If you type in the Magical Mystery Macrophage Tour on YouTube, you'll find that talk and you can access that. And I do, you know, talk about tissue resident macrophages there and, you know, where they reside in your body. But today we'll just focus on the ones in your brain. And these microglia are these tissue resident macrophages, which means that they developed from the embryo. Okay, the, actually the yolk sac of the embryo. And then they very early in uh, the development of the embryo, they seed different tissues in your body. They may seed, you know, the liver, they seed the skin and so forth, and they seed the brain. And um, these are distinct and different from macrophages that later come from your bone marrow. All right, so it's very important when you think about immune cells to think about their lineage and where they come from. And with tissue resident macrophages, again, they developed from the embryo, from the embryonic yolk sac. And very early in development, they seeded the tissue, including the brain. So when we look at these tissue resident macrophages, the microglia in the brain, for example, we think of immune cells as generally having, you know, an inflammatory function, right? So when you get an infection, they get revved up to defend your body against the infection. But these tissue resident macrophages, the microglia in your brain, also have homeostatic function. And by that, I mean housekeeping function. So they go around and they clean up the junk in your brain. Now, some of us maybe didn't get as much cleanup as we would like, right? Um, but, you know, we all know 
some people that we're thinking of in that category. But we can be kind and compassionate and just realize that maybe their microglia weren't working as well. Okay, nonetheless, they have this homeostatic function. So they clean up the junk that accumulates in your brain. They clean up dying cells, right? They kind of mop up debris if, if there's been some damage to certain cells. And they kind of keep the brain environment clean and, you know, sort of healthy for the other cells in the brain. And they are also self-renewing. So in order to regenerate and to repopulate, they're not going to rely on the bone marrow within their own um, cell line. They're going to renew themselves. Okay, so that's the important thing about the microglia because they are keeping your brain and all the cells in the brain in a healthy state. You can think of it as um, kind of like a an aunt or an uncle that likes to clean up. You ever see those kinds of people? They like arrive at someone else's house and they immediately start straightening things out and you know they're they're rearranging things and throwing things out and then they want to know oh what's your neighbor doing oh who's that across the street right you can think of your microglia that way because they do a lot of functions and they're constantly surveying your brain and making sure that everything is functioning properly in the brain now they have different states so in a steady state they have a particular shape that we call uh, sort of a ramified shape, R-A-M-I-F-I-E-D. And this means it almost looks like a star, actually. They have all these arms, right, that spread out. And that gives them this particular state or shape in the steady state. When they're quiet and just kind of doing their little housekeeping routine, but you know, trust me, they're scanning the environment, right? And they're constantly, you know, assessing what's going on in the brain. And they also are in touch with all the different cells in the brain. Particularly, they are in contact with neuronal synapses. So these are the junctions, the communication junctions between different neurons, right? And so the microglia are in contact with those junctions and they prune these junctions because you know a neuron can have many synaptic junctions and these microglia are going to prune these uh, synaptic junctions how do they do it they actually eat up the ones that aren't being used okay and when they eat up things in the brain that's called phagocytosis so they phagocytose these unused uh, synapses so if there's, you know, little synapses that haven't been activated or used in a while, your microglia are going to go, well, why are we keeping that around, right? Don't like clutter and gobble, gobble, we get rid of those synapses and we call that pruning, pruning, okay? They also interact with adult neural progenitor cells and um, oligodendrocyte cells, right? All the progenitor cells, they interact with them and they're in constant communication uh, with all these other cells. Now, when we have any kind of damage situation or infection possibility, you know, of an infection in the brain, uh, then these microglia, they start to go into like their activated state. And this is when they change their shape. So remember, they had this ramified shape that had these arms that were all spread out. Now, when you activate them, let's say in the case of an infection, they actually become rounder and less like with the arms stretching out and they become more amoeboid, okay? So it's kind of like a glob, right? And this, if you ever seen like representations or even movies of amoeba, you, you know what I mean. This kind of fluid uh, glob that kind of moves around and can swallow things. So when your microglia are activated, they become just like that. And this change in shape makes them more compact. And we think maybe that's, you know, facilitating travel, right? So they can move to areas of the brain where they can, you know, deal with the pathogen uh, 
with the bug that's invading the brain, for example. And then they can also phagocytose or eat up any foreign material, any debris that they may find in the way. Now, when they are activated, they also express different proteins on their surfaces. So these proteins um, will do different things, and some of them are these pro-inflammatory cytokines. So they use these proteins to signal other cells and other components of the immune system. They also will have a production of reactive oxygen species. And these are actually free radicals. These are you know, substances that are very volatile and can be very destructive. Now, why would they do that? Because if we generate these reactive oxygen species and they are very destructive, we can use them as weapons against any foreign invader, right? So we can destroy the bacteria, for example, that might be invading the brain. So we think of the activated state as a pro-inflammatory state, but I want to remind you that, you know, again, microglia, macrophages in general, but microglia are very complex. So they're not just going to be one thing, right? A lot of times when we talk about macrophages and microglia, we talk about M1 polarization and M2 polarization. And when people say that the M1 is supposed to be the inflammatory state and the M2 is supposed to be the anti-inflammatory state, um, but it's actually not like that in real life. We just use it to think about these uh, immune cells in a conceptual way, but they're constantly expressing proteins that and, and, and uh, substances that can be inflammatory on the one hand and also anti-inflammatory because while they are dealing with the foreign material in your brain or you know the pathogen that's attacking your brain, while they're doing their defense sort of jobs there, they're also still trying to keep the brain healthy and clean up the brain, right? So you're going to see them have these anti-inflammatory factors uh, being secreted, growth factors, and this is very important for healing of damaged tissue. So while they're defending you, they're also trying to help you heal which is remarkable, right? So we should always remember that it's never one or the other. It's always way more uh, complex than that. Now, the microglia also have receptors for neuronal ligands, and this would be receptors that generally tend to be inhibitory, right? And they have names like CX3, CR1, or CD200R. Don't worry about the names, but they have these receptors that can bind to healthy neuronal surfaces. And what that happens, what happens then is when they're bound to these neuronal surfaces, then it keeps the microglia in that quiet, steady state and it prevents them from being activated, right? So in a healthy state, when they have this type of binding to uh, neurons, it, it you know, all is well and they stay in that, you know, generally quiet state. Now, something can come about to disrupt that. So let's think about what happens when we are subjected to stress. Okay, here in this case, let's just use an acute stress model because it's just easy right now. Uh, I always use the saber tooth tiger. I don't know why. I just like saying saber-toothed tiger. I like the word saber. And that's probably why I always say saber-toothed tiger. Anyway, say you meet a saber-toothed tiger. And that, I think, for most people would be a stressful situation, right? And the limbic system in your brain is going to be activated. So that would include parts of the brain like the amygdala, the prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus, the hypothalamus, right? And these areas of your brain are really gonna be activated under that stress of meeting the saber-toothed tiger and we're going to activate your sympathetic nervous system, 
right? And when we do that, we're going to stimulate the adrenal glands. These are the little glands that sit on top of your kidneys. And the uh, part of the adrenal gland that's called the adrenal medulla is going to secrete noradrenaline or adrenaline. Okay, other names for those substances are norepinephrine or epinephrine. Okay, so sometimes you hear epinephrine and that's the same as adrenaline. Sometimes you hear norepinephrine and that's noradrenaline. Okay, so we secrete those substances into the bloodstream and then you're going to raise your blood pressure and then we're going to have increased heart rate and so forth right to help you deal with the stress either you're going to fight the saber tooth tiger so you know you're going to need that extra energy boost for that or you know running away will require an energy boost too because you hope to win that race right between you and the saber tooth tiger so you're going into a massive sprint all right you also activate the HPA, which is the hypothalamic pituitary axis, okay? And what happens is generally, I don't want to go in depth, but specific areas of your brain are activated and they secrete substances that promote the secretion of glucocorticoid hormones from the cortex, different part of the adrenal gland, all right? So again, the adrenal medulla is going to secrete the adrenaline or adrenaline and the cortex of the adrenal gland will secrete the glucocorticoid hormones yeah hence the name and you know the active form of you know these glucocorticoid hormones in humans would be cortisol and you've probably heard of that so just to recap you see the tiger adrenal uh, glands are going to secrete the noradrenaline and the cortisol into the bloodstream to help you access energy. And those substances will also communicate with immune cells. Now, in the brain, we activate the amygdala, the hypothalamus, like I said. But then this also activates an area of the brain called the locus ceruleus, L-O-C-U-S, and then ceruleus is C-O-E-R-U-L-E-U-S, okay? Not to worry about the name, but basically this is the main site of noradrenaline production in the brain, okay? Because we were talking about the adrenal glands before, and that's going to secrete it into your bloodstream, right? Those, those substances that we talked about. But here we're talking about the noradrenaline being secreted within an area of the brain. And because the locus ceruleus has uh, catecholaminergic axons, you know, uh, branches of the neurons going to many areas of the brain, then we're actually going to be flooding those areas uh, with noradrenaline during the stressful episode. Okay, so as I said, we have a peripheral response right, in the bloodstream, but in the brain, we also have a sympathetic response with surge of adrenaline within the brain. Now, in vivo, we found that when you stimulate these beta adrenergic receptors, these are receptors that respond to the noradrenaline, right? You stimulate the beta adrenergic re uh, receptors um, in the um, stressful events, and we get increase in neuroinflammation. And how do we know? Well, we see an increase in an inflammatory cytokine called interleukin-1 beta in the brain, right? We see that surge when we see that we activate the beta adrenergic uh, system. Now, if we block those receptors, right? So we have beta blockade, then, you know, we also block that increase in interleukin-1 beta. So if you block it, you actually don't see the surge in interleukin-1 beta, which is an inflammatory cytokine. Now, in a social defeat model of stress, I'm going to actually talk about this model of stress that they use in rodents a lot. And when you hear me say social defeat model of stress, basically it's a bully situation, right? They expose the 
rodent or mouse rat, whatever, that they're studying to a big, badass, bully mouse or rat, okay? So it's probably something that's a lot bigger and more aggressive um, than the actual study mouse, okay? So that is a bullying situation. And when you expose the mouse to that situation, we see that the microglia are activated and we also see this increase in interleukin-1 beta, and then we see this anxious behavior come about with uh, the, the mice, right? Now, if you block the beta receptors, right, then you didn't see that anxious behavior, even when they were subjected to the bully, okay? So it really is associated with um, this increase in microglia activation, and then increase in inflammatory cytokine interleukin-1 beta, and then we see the resultant anxious behavior in the mice. So, you know, that's one part of how we can impact your immune cells, the microglia in your brain through stress. Now, what about the glucocorticoids, the cortisol, right? We were talking about through the HPA axis. This is actually way more complex. I've actually up till now kind of skirted around talking about the HPA axis and glucocorticoid action. Um, and I, I know sometimes people reference that a lot in stress, but I just want to emphasize it's a pretty complex response. Um, when you talk about glucocorticoid action, yeah, it's not so cut and dry, you know, it's not so simple because it depends very much on the cell type and the context as usual, right? Always depends on the context and glucocorticoids themselves actually have both pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory properties. So a lot of times when you hear people talk about cortisol, they're always just going to be stressing the anti-inflammatory effects. And and a lot of times when we use steroids, right, like prednisone and stuff like that, we're really kind of trying to um, exploit the anti-inflammatory um, aspects of these uh, glucocorticoids. But the thing is that these uh, substances can bind to different receptors. And primarily we have the mineral corticoid receptor and the glucocorticoid receptor. These two different types of receptors that your cortisol can bind to. Now you can think of the mineral corticoid receptor, it's quite a mouthful, but generally, or you can in your head, think about it as MR, both in caps, right? Mineral corticoid receptor that's pretty inflammatory when activated, okay? So you can think of that as an inflammatory response. But when we bind the glucocorticoid receptor, we can then generally see more of an anti-inflammatory effect. Now, complicating this further is that different tissues in your body may have enzymes that can inactivate cortisol, right? And when that happens and we have exposure to those enzymes that inactivate the cortisol in that tissue, then you're in those tissue, you're going to see more mineral corticoid action, right? And therefore more of an inflammatory action, right? So it's not just that, oh, you know, cortisol does this, it's anti-inflammatory. It depends on the type of receptor that it binds to, it depends on whether different tissues have enzymes that will kind of shut down or inactivate the cortisol. And then we have promotion of more of the mineral corticoid action, which is more pro-inflammatory. And it depends on the concentration of the glucocorticoids as well. So generally when we have low to sort of moderate levels of cortisol, they're going to bind to the mineral corticoid receptor and we see more expression of pro-inflammatory uh, types of effects. In high concentrations, the glucocorticoids tend to bind to the glucocorticoid receptor, GRs, and there we see more anti-inflammatory effects. And this is also sex-dependent. 
right? The differences between men and women because of the influence of estrogen binding, right? So as you can see, it's not as simple. That's why I've generally kind of skirted around the issue of the HPA axis um, because sometimes people just make it very simplistic, um, but it really is a very complex system. There is a more anti-inflammatory effect generally with microglial glucocorticoid receptor activation in the steady state. Okay, so in the steady state, when we have these quiescent, well-behaved, uh, hard-working little microglia that are just kind of cleaning uh, the brain debris and taking care of housekeeping duties, then we actually have more of an anti-inflammatory effect with the glucocorticoid signaling. And when you have stress, what did we say? We can have an increase in cortisol, right? Now, this high-dose cortisol uh, will also give an anti-inflammatory effect. But, but, yes, there's always a but. At the same time, and that's why this is complex, at the same time, we're going to prime the immune system for future stress events, right? And what we do is, we at the same time are going to sensitize the microglia to uh, stresses, such as, let's say, LPS, like, and that's an endotoxin from bacteria, okay? So that's pretty stressful for your brain to get some kind of toxin from bacteria, right? So if you have high levels of glucocorticoid floating around your brain, yes, it has a nice anti-inflammatory effect, but at the same time, it can also prime those same microglia to, towards future stress events, sensitize them so that when, let's say, you expose them to the stress again, in this case, let's say that endotoxin from the bacteria, they have an exaggerated cytokine response. You know, sometimes people talk about cytokine storm, right? Very dramatic. But, um, you know, you could think of it that way where now we're hypersensitive and we just have this huge surge of cytokines at this second stressful event and also other subsequent stress events. All right, when we have a model of chronic unpredictable or um, stress in rodent models, that's a pretty like rough model on the rodents, I think, you know. So when they use this chronic unpredictable stress model on rodents, essentially, you know, for weeks on end, they kind of really they just give the rodents a really hard time. So for example, They'll tilt the cage suddenly or shake the cage or they'll make loud noises and, you know, in the middle of the night, they'll turn on the lights or deprive the rodents of light uh, uh, of light in the, in the daytime, right? So they'll switch up the, the, the light signaling, for example. They'll expose them to smells from predators, right? And um, maybe you know, restrict them or in some way or restrain them in some way. So pretty nasty things that they do. And they do this unpredictably, randomly, right? So uh, the mice never know when it's coming and they also don't know what is coming. So one moment they could be shaking the cage and then the next moment it's food uh, or water deprivation, right? And the next moment they meet a bully mouse and then another time, you know, they're flooded with the smells of predators, probably cat or something, right? So that's, as you can tell, pretty stressful for the mice. Well, they used in this experiment um, female mice, and what they did was they subjected them to this chronic unpredictable stress. Now, when they had depletion, these mice, female mice, had depletion of the glucocorticoid receptor, Right? So now they don't have the glucocorticoid receptor, which is anti-inflammatory. They only have the mineral corticoid receptor, which is pro-inflammatory. Interestingly, they had no TNF alpha increase, and that's an inflammatory cytokine. So interestingly, you would think they would be sort of in a more inflammatory state because they only have the mineral corticoid receptor, right? 
But here, no, they don't have any increase in TF, TNF alpha, and they have decreased proteins associated with phagocytosis. So, like I told you, when they're activated, they're constantly gobbling things up, right? And they're phagocytosing things actively. But here, you know, without the glucocorticoid receptor in these female mice subjected to chronic, unpredictable stress, they had decreased proteins associated with phagocytosis and their gene expression was more of the anti-inflammatory profile um, rather than the inflammatory ones, right, in, in, in the microglia. So we can see how complex this is and glucocorticoid receptor activation uh, in microglia is very important, obviously, in the stress response but complex and we don't understand all of it. So I'm always nervous when people try to make simplistic, you know, statements about the HPA axis and the action of, of glucocorticoids, for example. And I just want to point out it's very complex here. All right, uh, what else? Okay, with chronic stress, as I said, we're going to impact microglial phenotype, right? And this is sort of how they express themselves. So with chronic stress, we see increased activation markers, right? So we see markers that tell us they are more activated. So these are things like IBO1, for example. You don't have to remember the names, but when we see that, we know they are more in an activated state. We also see increase in a protein called CD86 that is required for T cell activation. You don't have T cells in the brain really, not in the brain tissue really, but we start to see expression of this and it's like it's changing, it. the microglia are changing their profile and then you can see them actually becoming more phagocytic, right? So again, they are going to be more amoeboid and then start to gobble things up. Now, what we've noted is that with chronic stress, we see increase in proliferation of microglia in the amygdala and other stress responsive areas of the brain. Uh, but that's just the beginning, because in the beginning, you have chronic stress and over time now we see proliferation, increase in microglia in those stress responsive areas of the brain. But then shortly after the proliferation, guess what? Some of them die off. So they undergo programmed cell death or apoptosis. They actually die off so that after a few weeks, you actually end up with less microglia in some areas of the brain. So at first you have this proliferation, yay, but then no, because some of them just kind of, they just kill themselves, right? And now we have areas in the brain that actually are depleted or have very little microglia there. And don't forget, the microglia are important in the housekeeping functions and keeping the brain healthy, right? So chronic stress primes the microglia to have a more inflammatory uh, profile, but also later they have an exaggerated response, as I said earlier, to other stresses like endotoxin. And when we look at, again, the social defeat model where we expose the mouse uh, to a bully mouse, right? We see this increase in the pro-inflammatory cytokines for up to 24 days after the last bully event, okay? So with that, we also see increased anxious behavior, increased sort of social avoidant type behaviors, right? And those cytokines kind of stay upregulated well after the actual bullying or stress event. Okay, there are some fascinating studies that I really wanted to include here. Here they use mice um, whose microglia were wiped out. And so they use an inhibitor to something called colony stimulating factor one receptor or CSF1 receptor. All right. Don't need to remember the name. The main thing is the CSF1 receptor is very important for the survival of microglia 
okay? You don't have that and the microglia die. So guess what? They give these mice an inhibitor to CSF1 receptor. And of course, now we don't have the action of the CSF1 receptor. And of course, then the microglia die. So we kill off the microglia in um, those mice. But now we subject them to chronic social defeat while they have no microglia, right? So you subject them to that bully mouse several times, several exposures, but there are no microglia in the brains of the mice experiencing the bully events. Okay. Now, after that, you repopulate the brain with microglia, and the way you do that is you just get rid of the inhibitor, right? You don't give them the inhibitor anymore, and then the microglia will you know, be able to respond to CSF1 receptor, and then they now proliferate again. And now, when you actually expose them to the bully mouse, they're going to have anxious behavior. You're going to see that they have that anxious behavior and that avoidant behavior. Okay, the microglia weren't even there when they were experiencing the bullying events. But when you repopulate the brain with the microglia and now put them under that social defeat stress event, they actually show the anxious behavior. Okay, further study um, showed something else that I thought was pretty remarkable. So here again, during the chronic stress events, right, it's chronic, so they did this multiple times, they had no microglia because they wipe out the microglia now subject them to chronic stress with the bully several times. Now after the last social defeat session, again, they take away the inhibitor and they allow the microglia to come back and repopulate. Just the repopulation with microglia alone, without subjecting them to another bully event. Okay? Just those microglia coming back brought about the anxious and social avoidant behavior. Just by the microglia coming back. So clearly, now there were changes in the brain that kind of affected uh, microglial priming, right? Now those microglia that came back, even though they weren't around during the stress situation, they're different somehow. And just them coming back impacted the brain in such a way that the behavior was changed. We saw a lot more of the anxiety and the social avoidant behaviors. And really, there are many, many, many studies showing that when you block microglial activation in the brain in chronic stress, we don't get those behaviors like anxiety. We don't get behaviors like anhedonia, which is a lack of pleasure, right? So sort of the depressive symptoms, right? So if you block um, the activation of microglia, when you subject um, the uh, animal models to chronic stress, you actually didn't see those behaviors uh, uh, developing. Okay, and as I said, you know, this is working directly on the microglia, but the microglia also makes cytokines. Those cytokines impact different populations of cells in the brain and in impact inflammation in general in the brain, the reactive oxygen species that I talked about, right? This enhanced phagocytosis pruning, so they're gobbling up all these different synaptic junctions, right? And all of this is going to impact how the brain is sort of reshaped after uh, a stress event. So doing a very, very quick and general wrap up here before I talk about what are some of the things then that we should do to address anxiety and, um, you know, some of these, uh, you know, social avoidant behaviors. So we talked about how chronic stress is repeated exposure, right? 
to stressful events and how stress is very physiologic. We can actually measure it in the body. So it's not imagined. It's actually happening in your body. And we have changes in neurotransmitters and hormonal levels, but we also are you know, activating immune cells. And we see this by different cytokines being produced by those cells in your body. Now, in the brain specifically, we talk about the immune cell in the brain tissue, and that would be the microglia. And in general, because they are tissue resident macrophages, they are there for housekeeping purposes, right? And in their steady state, they have this nice branched out shape, and they're constantly surveying the environment and getting rid of cell, cellular debris. And also, they're in contact with neurons, the synapses, and pruning unused synapses, right? They interact with all the other cells like the astrocytes and the oligodendrocytes in uh, the brain. Now, when they are activated, then they change shape and they become more amoeboid and they start phagocytosing things more actively, gobbling things up. They start expressing inflammatory proteins, right? And they signal other cells, other inflammatory cells uh, to, to kind of aggregate closer to the brain. And they also make a lot of these uh, very, you know, volatile, uh, destructive substances called reactive oxygen species. But at the same time, they are also expressing some anti-inflammatory factors to you know, help with regeneration and healing. And um, you know, so there's a complex reaction there. And we talked about how stress activates the uh, sympathetic nervous system and we have some adrenaline or adrenaline floating in your bloodstream from the adrenal glands, and we also activate the secretion of cortisol from your adrenal glands, right? And this is floating around in your bloodstream, but in the brain, there's an area in the brain that also gets activated called the locus ceruleus, and that secretes noradrenaline and floods the brain with the noradrenaline when you're under stress. And actually, if we block the effect of the noradrenaline in the brain, we see decrease in interleukin-1 beta, which is an inflammatory cytokine in the brain. And also, we can also see that you don't have anxious behavior developing in animal models that have, uh, you know, had a blockade of those uh, sympathetic um, uh, receptors in the brain, right? So that's one aspect of how, you know, those uh, those neurotransmitters can impact the brain. Now, we then looked at the glucocorticoids. I talked about cortisol. That's very complex. It can bind to different receptors and express uh, pro-inflammatory sort of molecules, and it can also be anti-inflammatory. This depends on the type of receptor it binds to. It depends on the tissue because different tissues may have enzymes that inactivate the cortisol. And then it depends on the concentration of cortisol. It depends on whether you're a male or female, right? So it's a complex uh, reaction, but we know here that we do generally have in the brain more of an anti-inflammatory effect of the cortisol on um, the glucocorticoid receptors in the microglia, right? And when we under stress, we have these uh, cortisol levels go very high and that keeps that anti-inflammatory environment to control the inflammation. That's really important. But it can also prime the microglia to be more reactive in the future to future stress events. So now we're going to have exaggerated responses, exaggerated increases in cytokines, right, at a future stress event. So these things uh, make it very complex, but we know for sure one thing we can just say is that those glucocorticoid hormones do impact the microglia in terms of priming them and how they react in stress, right? And those microglia change shape, they change uh, the proteins that they express, and once they've been uh, subjected to stress, right, um, and especially chronic repeated stress over time, they are primed. And by that, they kind of are hypersensitive again, 
and any time now you 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 subject them to stress they're going to over express a lot of these anti-inflammatory effects which are then correlated to increase anxiety and increase social avoidant behaviors here and even when you wipe out the microglia and you think, okay, maybe now we won't have any of those behaviors developing. When you actually allow the microglia to repopulate and then subject those animal models to stress again, we see actually an exaggerated response and those animals become anxious. And we don't even have to subject them to a stressful event. Just letting the microglia that had been depleted come back and repopulate the brain already brought about and induce anxious behavior in the animal models okay so just that alone the microglia being present was enough in that case and we know that when we block microglial activation we actually with the chronic stress model uh, we block you know, in anxious behaviors and depressive behaviors in those uh, mice models. That's been shown very clearly in many, many, many studies. All right, so now that we realize that when you're under chronic stress, it impacts these immune cells in your brain such that really it's primed to be more inflammatory, more activated, right? Secreting a lot of these damaging substances in your brain. What can you do? Well, obviously, you know by now that somehow we have to decrease the inflammation. So what are some of the things that are really important in helping people kind of get back that balance in their brains? where they're not hyper-inflamed. The most important thing, I think, for me with my patients when I first see them, I try very hard to regulate their sleep. You may not know this, but we think of ourselves as having a circadian rhythm, right? We respond to day and night, right? The exposure to natural light and then dark, right? So that's, you know, generates a rhythm that we call circadian rhythm. Every cell in your body, and this includes all your immune cells, every immune cell has a circadian rhythm. Okay, and when we are actually in an inflamed state, a lot of times that rhythm is out of whack. It's which comes first, chicken or egg? Sometimes it's the poor, um, you know, sort of uh, day night cycle that is causing the inflammation and a lot of times um, something else may cause the inflammation but it's made worse by disrupted sleep uh, day night cycles right circadian rhythms so sleep sleep is vital and you have to make time to have consistent adequate sleep at least eight hours is what i recommend now What's challenging is when people have a lot of anxiety, their sleep also suffers because they have insomnia, because they can't, you know, kind of shut their minds off, right? So that's very complex. And with my patients, we work really hard to deal with the insomnia. We have different things that we try with them. And, and you know, we've been actually very, quite successful with our patients. And most people have much improved sleep uh, and the insomnia is uh, is gone, right? But it takes time and it takes, uh, you know, really patience and practice. But you absolutely have to at least prioritize fixed sleep and wake times, regular consistent sleep without changes in circadian rhythm. I don't like it when people switch up their sleep times over the weekend because you can think of that as crossing different time zones, right? And that impacts your body. And if you have neuroinflammation, you just wanna make sure the conditions are prime for your brain to rest and to heal. All right, nutrition, because there are lots of inflammatory diets out there. You know that high sugar, processed foods, all of these things, you know, a lot of seed oils, these are highly inflammatory for your brain. 
and it causes leakiness at the blood-brain barrier, for example. So more of the inflammatory cytokines from the periphery can get into the brain, for example, right? So if you don't prioritize nutrition, then we're really not going to impact you know, or help the inflammation in the brain. So getting uh, control and taking charge of the uh, diet is very important. Exercise is really important as well, right? Because exercise too can help people with stress management and really um, a lot of patients also sleep better when they've had sufficient good exercise. Um, it's, it's, it's really, you know, uh, one of the most valuable things for management of stress. I want to add in here that you have to pay attention to your metabolic health because We've seen time and time again that increased dysfunctional fat, a lot of that visceral fat, right? So even if you look thin, you may have normal weight obesity if you have a lot of the dysfunctional fat. And this is well known. When you have a lot of dysfunctional fat, you have chronic inflammation right, throughout your whole body. And that is going to impact your brain as well. And it's going to impact the microglia in your brain and this can change your behaviors that way. People don't think about metabolic health and their behaviors, right? But really, your metabolic health impacts really all aspects of your health, including your mental health, including your behaviors. And of course, we have to talk about behavioral change. So with my patients, we really work very hard. We spend a lot of time working with them on, you know, kind of uh, reframing, identifying their ants, uh, what we call ants or automatic negative thoughts, right? Because if you have constant automatic negative thoughts, that is a source of constant repeated stress on you, right? And that can bring about changes in your brain and the microglia that can bring about anxiety. So working with our patients, uh, using meditation, using breathing techniques to calm them down, right? Um, addressing some of their cognitive distortions so that they're able to process more how their thoughts are impacting their, their emotions, right? These things are really, really important. So, you know, when people talk about mental health, what we don't really recognize or maybe emphasize enough is you just cannot separate it out, right? Because you're an integrated whole. And when you talk about mental health, you have to address your general health. And you can see now uh, how inflammation impacts your behavior and your mental health. If you're not getting rid of the inflammation by taking care of your metabolic health, then we're really not significantly going to really address the behaviors, okay? So uh, uh, like I said, sleep, very important, nutrition, exercise, and behavioral change, uh, getting rid of ants, auto automatic negative thoughts, reframing, all those things. Yeah. And it's a lot to do. Um, you know, we certainly have worked with patients and been very successful in helping them change their behaviors. And if you need help or you want help from us, then do reach out. Um, you can go to tulaversity.com and that's spelled T-U-L-A-V-E-R-S-I-T-Y.com, tulaversity.com. And that's where you can find a complete behavior change and lifestyle change program that I developed to help people achieve metabolic health, okay? So check that out, tulaversity.com. You can also, I hope you do, come attend some of my live Q&As. I usually put up the dates on my website, vivianloemd.com, V-Y-B-Y-A-N-E-L-O-H-M-D.com. So you can come if you have questions, maybe there's something that was unclear to you or you want to share part of your metabolic health journey, uh, do attend one of the live Q&A sessions. I'd love to meet you and chat with you. Okay, I hope you learned a lot uh, about microglia and also neuroinflammation and how that is linked to your behaviors, to anxiety, to avoidant behaviors, for example. I hope it was helpful for you.
um, signing out now from VLMD Rounds. I'm Dr. Vivian Lowe and I sing the body electric. Have a good week. Bye.